Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Tuesday, September 27th meeting of the Transportation and Parking Commission. And I just want to announce that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, and uh, we will get started now. My name is uh, Donna Lascalia, and I'm the Director of Public Works, also the Chair of this Commission. And um, Beth, when you are ready, please call the roll. Donna? Here. Jody? Here. Jamie? Here. Carolyn? Here. Nancy? Here. Karen? Here. Jamila? Here. Diana? Here. Okay. Okay, eight, thanks. Eight voting thanks. members. Thanks, Beth. Okay, next up is uh, public comment. I see that there are several members of the public here. Um, I We have a fairly full agenda this afternoon. Uh, what I would ask is that if you are here to speak to a particular agenda item, please hold your comments until we get to that agenda item. Just makes uh, for a little more of an orderly meeting. Um, but in the event you are here to speak to the commission about something that is not on the agenda, uh, you're certainly free to do so now. Uh, if you would like, I just ask that you state your uh, name and city or town of residence for the record and, and limit your comments to two minutes. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak to the commission on, on a topic that is not on the agenda this afternoon? You're welcome to raise your virtual hand and we will recognize you. Okay, I don't see any hands. All right, so we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the prior meeting, August 16th, 2022. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? I'll make that motion. May I have second. a second? Okay, second. sorry, who was the second, Nancy? Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any discussion on the minutes from the prior meeting? Wait, I'm sorry, was Carolyn or Nancy the second? I I called second, but uh, yeah, Nancy's yeah. shaking her head. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Any discussion on the minutes? Okay. Hearing none. Beth, please call the roll. Donna. Yes. Jody. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Abstain. I wasn't here. Jamila? Yes. Diana? Yes. That's seven yeses and one abstention. Thank you, Beth. Next up is reports from departments and subcommittees. So uh, a couple of DPW announcements. Uh, pavement preservation, we are working on West Hampton Road, West Farms Road, and the section of Florence Road between the city limits and Route 66. Um, all of these roadways are receiving a surface treatment of asphalt. The first layer has been applied, and the second layer is going to be applied this week. So it'll be a smooth asphalt surface when it's done. Um, the idea behind, behind this is preserving the useful life of the roadway by more than 10 years. Um, we also have a contract for our pavement markings. Um, we have Markings Inc. is the name of the contractor. They've been repainting all the crosswalks, uh, all the roadway markings uh, across the entire city. So double yellow center lines, the fog lines, bike lanes, turn arrows, parking spaces. Uh, the contractor works at night to minimize traffic impacts. Part of this contract, several crosswalks along the Mass Central Rail Trail will be improved with green paint. We're also gonna have a contractor mobilizing for crack sealing. Project's been awarded to Indus, and it is anticipated they're going to mobilize in mid-October. Work includes crack sailing, uh, several recreation field parking lots in various streets, including sections of Route 9, Florence Road, and Pine Street. There are also several ongoing Mass DOT projects on King Street, Damon Road, and Route 5. Questions about these projects should be directed to um, Mass DOT. Uh, any other updates for the commission? Anyone? Um, is this for um, other departments? 
you're asking for now or just related yep. to your question? So. Yeah, no, other, any other updates are fine. Yeah. Go for okay. it. Um, sure, I have a couple. Um, and Donna, you might I might need your assistance on this one for Pleasant Street. We uh, thought we were pretty close to getting to the last punch list items and there was a water main break. Um, uh, at service center. So we're not able to get through striping and signing on Pleasant Street. So that's extending the project a little bit. Do you know, um, I think that strip was paved, but I don't know what the status is since that happened. So I don't know if Donna, you have something about that. Yeah, we actually have some trouble with the water main there. I mean, it was very bad timing. The water main broke um, several hours before the Taste of Northampton was scheduled to begin. Um, and it, it created some significant traffic difficulties for us. So we needed to just stabilize the main and reopen the road as quickly as we could. Um, but we do have some further work we need to do on the main there. So that that's actually gonna delay, uh, finish repaving and resetting of the curb. Um, and we, we've actually been in conversation with the contractor about how to proceed there, but it's, it's definitely gonna delay up by a little bit. Okay. Um, and then just a couple other projects that we were overseeing on street projects. Um, uh, Florence Streetscapes is down to the wire as well. The contractor is going to be striping and signing there as well, and that includes wayfinding and also installing bike racks. So that will be, um, you'll see that in the next um, few weeks. I think that will be um, winding down pretty quickly. Um, we are starting, uh, we've gotten the notice to proceed. I don't, I think we've had this since the last meeting, notice to proceed for the um, shared streets um, grant for the covered bike shelter. So we're starting to look at locations and also funding, you know, the pricing has gone up since that application was submitted. So we don't know how we're gonna be constrained. Um, for the act, you know, the type of um, structure that we are going to install, but we'll be um, proceeding, just investigating that further. Um, the, uh, we're working on the Connecticut River Trail design from the Connecticut River Greenway north towards Hatfield. You probably saw the letter in the paper to, or the article in the paper today about the Hatfield meeting public forum last week. Uh, so we're still in conversations with Hatfield as to whether or not they want the trail extended in Hatfield, but um, either way, we're still working towards um, creating some network, even if it stops at the city line. Um, and let's see, um, we're still in a holding pattern for Picture Main Street. Haven't gotten the notice yet from DOT to uh, for the 25% design public hearing. They initially thought it was going to be the end of October, but there's going to be first thing we have to get through a utility coordination meeting before DOT will set the date for that. So it may be pushed off into early November. Um, and I think that's about it. Okay, thanks very much. Any other members of the commission have any updates for us? Okay, hearing none, we will move into uh, matters before the commission. First up is a discussion of a traffic calming request for Fair Street. Uh, so we received a traffic calming request July 25th, 2021. Um, I will not read all of the text, um, but the concern was that generally um, it, there was um, a thought that uh, folks might be uh, speeding. There's a blind corner at the entrance to the fairgrounds um, and asked the city to take a look at the area. So as we do with um, all of our traffic calming requests, um, we did uh, uh, an engineering assessment, a collision assessment, and a speed assessment. So Fair Street provides one lane of travel in the east and west directions between Bridge Street and Cross Path Road. It's approximately 1,940 feet long and 22 feet wide. There are no sidewalks and there are also no pavement markings that are present. Parking is allowed on both sides for the entire length of the street. There is no existing speed regulation, but Fair Street is considered thickly settled. So therefore the statutory speed limit is 30 miles an hour. I'll also note that the pavement is in poor condition. 
Um, Chief, would you like to speak to the collision and speed data? Sure, thank you. So as per usual, when we look at these, we did a five-year collision analysis. I conducted this on July 27th of 2021 after this first came in. Um, and there were no collisions on Fair Street. So it was a zero on the collision data. We then looked at the speed data. Covert speed data was collected from July 28th, 2021 to August 8th, 2021. During that time, just about 3,600 vehicles were analyzed. As the director mentioned, it's a posted 30 mile per hour area and the 85th percentile speed was 26 miles per hour. So we determined that speed was not a significant issue on Fair Street. That's all I have, thank you. Okay, thanks Chief. Um, so that, um, just for the folks who aren't familiar with how the traffic calming process works, we receive a request and we don't wanna bring it forward to the commission until and unless we actually have data to share with the commission. Um, so that is the, the results of our analysis. And now what I'd like to do is open it up to any member of the public who is here to speak to this uh, to this street. Um, so if you have any comments for us as we deliberate uh, potentially on uh, you know solutions or how to move forward, um, please raise your hand. I see Councillor Nash. Hold on a moment and we will unmute you. Okay, hello. Okay, hi Councillor. Hello, Director. <laughs> And nice to see Carolyn in this meeting too. And um, anyway, yeah, um, so uh, I, this was, I, so I had a discussion with the director of the fairgrounds a while back and I believe Councillor Foster was also part of that uh, Zoom discussion as we were discussing another matter. And um, that I, the, I think that the issue that they're talking about here has to do with, in, um, that there's a parking area area directly across the street from the main entrance to the fairgrounds on Fair Street. And that uh, people will park in that parking area. I, I imagine it can you know park as many as 500 cars. And, that, um, and so that a lot of people are crossing back and forth when it, in a, an event is in session. And also, um, they will use that parking area is uh, for during ho horse shows as another area to hold events. Uh, Morgan Horse Show, I, I drove by there over the summer and seeing um, uh, people with carts and horses doing all sorts of little things out in the field. Um, anyway, the, this is all to say that I, I think that the, the biggest concern has to do with the events and the pedestrians having to cross this area. And that um, I, I, I want to encourage the, the fairgrounds, I, in fact, I, in the meeting, I encourage them to reach out to the city to talk about if there's like temporary measures that they could be taking during an event. So if there's, I, I don't know what's legal, but being able to put out some cones or some signage indicating that up ahead where that little jog in the road is, that they can expect to see pedestrians, mach machinery, horses possibly crossing the road. Um, so I, I don't know, is that an option that they could reach out to the NPD and uh, DPW about something like that? Uh, Councilor, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of entities who have uh, various events around the city. Um, and so when folks, you know, are having those events, they often reach out to my department and, you know, will ask for various types of support. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly willing to uh, accommodate those requests to the extent that I can. So if it's, if, if we're looking at sort of additional signage just during an event, um, that would be different from, you know, more permanent signage that right. might be installed. Um, so I guess it would depend on the frequency of the events and what exactly we were talking about for, for signage. So based on that, uh, Director, I'm going to encourage the fairgrounds to reach out to 
should I have them reach out to you or to uh, the police chief about this or? Well, I, I think both of us, I mean, pr presumably, and I can't speak for the chief, but presumably mm -hmm. there is some police support that goes on during these events, though I, I, I don't know. Um, so, you know, it, it might be like, you know, different signage that's needed per event. Go ahead, Chief, I see you unmuted. Yeah, I, I would say to just direct that to both of us. And I mean, an option that they certainly have is to consider uh, hiring a traffic control person to be there that we could provide. So if they are interested in doing that, we could certainly accommodate that. And they do hire officers usually for inside security details, but they could just have a traffic control person there that might help with this. Certainly would be open to looking at signs that would warn drivers of a unique situation ahead in the road as well. Um, if horses are crossing, you know, a couple days of the year for these events, I, I see, think that seems like a reasonable request. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, folks borrow barricades from us or, you know, the different, you know, barrels or or whatever. And, and we're happy to support this however we can. Uh, again, you know, sort of depending on frequency and need. Um, Joe, I saw your actual hand up. Um, so I, I want to unmute you, Cindy. Joe Jasinski. Um, his actual hand is up, not his virtual hand. Yeah. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so what I am, I am the head of maintenance at the fairgrounds. And I also am a resident. I live right next door and I actually grew up on this road. So, and, and, and as you know, you know, traffic has, have gotten worse over the years. And the situation that we're in here is, uh, you know, we are on an S curve and have a blind driveway. And our, our situation is unique is because our office and our maintenance building is on one side and the fairgrounds is on the other. So we do cross back and forth, you know, dozens of times during the day. And we, I know there hasn't been any recent accidents, a lot of near misses. Um, the last one I can remember was back in the 90s when we had a six wheeler truck and the car came and ripped the axle right out from under it. Um, and I guess I, I know we were denied the, the the speed bumps, but if we can let drivers know at least that we have a blind blind corner here, um, and it's not just one or two shows a year that cross back and forth, um, we do pretty horse shows almost every weekend, and they like that field across the street. It's groomed really nice, and we kind of discourage them not to go over there, but it's pretty tough to control them 24 hours a day, and it'd be nice to at least have that option that, you know, drivers are known that we do have animals that will cross there. Um, Cause it is, it's just a dangerous driveway. And, and, and I've been out there many a nights myself, you know, and I know these girls are crossing over, you know, just to cross them back and forth, you know, so they don't, is there not a situation? Um, you know, I, it's, it's just a safety thing with me. It's, it's, you know, it's not just a matter of speeders, but um, it's a corner, it's a driveway that's so hard to see. And, and the last thing we want to see is an, an animal get hurt. Okay, appreciate those comments. So we'll we'll definitely take a look at the topography there. Um, you know, regarding your um, comment about speed humps, uh, it, it's not so much that that it was denied. It's you know we have to look at the data and determine you know what's a reasonable installation on a street by street basis based on what we're seeing for traffic volumes what we're seeing for traffic speeds um so what we want to do during this process is kind of give you an opportunity to say what the problems are hear from anyone else who wishes to speak other members of the commission um and you know everything's on the table at this point um and and what we need to do is hear what everybody's saying and then we will further assess the situation so that's that's what we're you know nothing's off the table everything's on the table right now and, and we want to make it better so that's why we're here um does anybody else have any comments are there any other members of the public here to speak to fair street i'll ask first i don't see any hands uh do any members of the commission have any comments about fair street yeah. 
Okay, seeing and hearing none. Joe, we appreciate you coming and counselor, thank you for your comments as well. So um, we will internally uh, have a conversation about what we think the best course of action is for this and we'll be in touch with you. Um, the, the chief or I will likely reach out to you, Joe, to, to talk about you know kind of what your schedule is um, and what sort of events you're, you're uh, putting on. So thank you. Any other comments about this before we move on to the next item? Okay, seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to discussion of traffic calming request for Clement Street. So traffic calming requests for Clement Street were submitted to us on August 20th, 2021 and August 16th, 2022. Um, again, these are fairly lengthy, so I will not read them, but uh, general comments are uh, that there is a concern about speeding. So um, I'll speak uh, from a, an engineering standpoint. Clement Street provides one lane of travel in the north and south direction between Birch Pit Road and Ladd Avenue. It is approximately 1,990 feet long and 24 feet wide. There are no sidewalks present. And there are also no pavement markings. There is a narrow bridge over the Mill River, which allows for passage of one direction of travel at a time, also known as the Clement Street Bridge. Parking is allowed on both sides of the street. And there is no existing speed regulation on Clement Street. Um, it is also considered thickly settled because uh, there is no existing speed regulation. We consider the statutory speed limit to be 30 miles an hour. We also consider the pavement to be in deficient condition. So what, what we have tried to do in the city is um, uh, kind of come up with creative ways to calm traffic. You know, we sort of have our, our speed hump idea, um, but there are certainly other ways. And one of them is through uh, roadway markings. And so we engaged with a citizen group of um, bicycle enthusiasts and uh, sort of transportation enthusiasts um, who helped us come up with an idea to install advisory bike lanes on this section of Clement Street um, based on the data which the chief is about to share with you. Um, and we submitted this application to the Federal Highway Association because we are required to get their approval for um, things that are non-standard. And our application was denied uh, pending further review um, of communities that had already instituted this advisory bike lane measure. So before I talk more about that, I'd just like the chief to share with us what she found in her collision review and in her speed data review. Thank you. Can I just ask a point of clarification, Director? You just mentioned the speed on that street. What did you say it was? Did you say it was um, not there, posted? In it, it, it is not posted. There is no existing speed regulation on that street, according to our records. All right. I'm looking at a picture of the street on the right on my other screen, and the data that I have compares it to the posted speed limit on the street, at least the sign. I don't. Maybe it's out of regulation, but um, yeah, this happens. Yes, this happens sometimes <laughs> where there is a sign that was placed that um, is not in accordance with the actual regulation, which um, certainly complicates things for us. Um, but our records show that there is no speed regulation on this street. Okay. All right. So bearing that in mind, <laughs> I'll present the data that I have. So for collision data, um, I looked at this data in September of 2021. Um, there were four collisions. One was a deer, which is kind of an anomaly. Obviously, speed's not a factor in the, the deer collision. One was at the intersection with Ladd Avenue, which is the other end after the bridge, which is not really the area of concern. And the other two were more on this straightaway. One was a rear end collision, and the other was a single vehicle crash where the driver said I was speeding and failed to negotiate the corner uh, down to the bridge. So uh, speed being a factor in one of those two collisions. As for speed, uh, we collected speed data twice. We've actually um, had this for a little while. We collected it in September of 2021 and then just freshened up the data for 2022, um, although the data remained fairly consistent. So the 22 data was collected 
through June 2nd, from May 26th to June 2nd, 17,000 vehicles were analyzed. The posted speed limit based on the sign is 25. So the average speed was 30, which would be more consistent if the speed limit's actually 30, maybe we don't have as much of a speeding problem. Um, but if it's 25, then we have more of a speeding problem. The 85th percentile speed was 33.5. So if it's a 25, going 33.5 would qualify as a significant speeding problem for the 85th percentile. If it's a 33.5 miles per hour over the, over the speed limit would not be a significant speeding problem as we would typically classify it. So that's the speed data. Okay, thanks Chief. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate, we often find when we analyze streets um, that we have signage that was placed that's actually not consistent with an existing regulation uh, or vice versa. Um, and, and that's something that is part of our analysis and the ultimate implementation of, of um, you know, a, a plan to better control traffic um, would have to be corrected. Um, so back to what I was talking about with the advisory bike lanes. Um, advisory bike lanes are, are sort of a, um, uh, they're a newer pavement marking um, treatment for roadways that um, basically allow bicycles to uh, have their own dedicated lane on either shoulder and force cars towards the center of the roadway. And um, they have been deployed in several major metropolitan areas within the United States. And they, um, you know, I, I, again, roadway markings are governed by FHWA. So where this is not a sanctioned installation, meaning it's not a standard installation, FHWA would have to approve this. We thought that this would be a good place to try this roadway treatment, given that Clement Street is um, got a really nice straight away. Um, and we felt that though that could be attractive for folks speeding, if we uh, installed this treatment, um, it, it could actually um, sort of visually narrow the roadway, make everything uh, safer for bicyclists. Um, and, and um, you know, it, it, it could be a really good pilot project for us. Um, but again, FHWA asked us to hold on this until more data is collected from other um, municipalities who have engaged in this process. Um, I also want to mention that Councillor Jarrett could not be here this afternoon, um, but he asked me to let folks um, who may be here for this neighborhood or also for Chestnut Street to, um, to uh, be in touch with him and that he'd be watching the recording of, of this um, video and that he'd be part of the conversation moving forward. So I just wanted to mention that um, while it was on my mind. Um, so now I'll ask if there's uh, any member of the public here who wishes to speak about Clement Street. Kristen, I see your hand up, so we will unmute you and go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, uh, Donna and everyone else. I'm part of the group of citizens um, that helped work on this, and um, I live in Holyoke now, but I lived about a block from uh, Clement Street Bridge for about five and a half years and actively rode my bike on Burt's Pit Road to Community Garden um, and a number of other places and still ride around there pretty frequently. And um, I'm also on the bike ped committee in Holyoke and on the Mass Bike Board. Um, so really interested in this project and so appreciative uh, to Director Lascalier for um, working with us on um, seeing what we could do. Um, and I would like to say that I will work with um, other citizens and folks from Mass Bike to see if we can come up with some examples of where this has been done in other places in the Commonwealth and I'm happy to, to share that as we try to see if we can um, make this happen here and maybe in some other places as well. So thank you so much. Hi, my name is Keith Milne. I live at 134 Clement. I'm about two doors down from Burt's Pit Road. I've been here six years now. Um, I put in a couple of these traffic calming requests. Um, and I'm really surprised at the data showing a 30 mile an hour average because 
we've quite literally had people pass other cars on this street and obviously doing 50 plus um, semi regularly, especially in the middle of the night. Often you hear that uh, if you're up around 11 o'clock, sometimes people will just race up and down this road. Um, everyone on, that I know in the neighborhood here, my neighbors around me have all complained. Um, but I, when I've asked if they've done anything about it, like a traffic call me, nobody has. So I've tried. Um, I, I really feel that making Clement Street either one way, putting a light at the bridge, which would force people to wait and take a turn like they did in Greenfield at Nash's Mill Road near the bike trail, which worked wonderfully um, as a traffic calming measure, or two speed humps about a third of the way, one, a third of the way up the hill from the bridge, because that's what people do is they come up the hill, they accelerate and they just keep on going all the way down the rest of the street. Um, they come around Burt's Pit Road and do the same thing, especially in the morning. They accelerate like there's no tomorrow, especially on the way to Northampton High. And the other issue I would like to mention is we have a lot of cars and trucks that come through here that are obviously not in compliance with noise they have modified exhaust systems, they have uncapped mufflers, and you can hear them for miles. You know, they come around this through here, you can hear them two miles away down Florence Road, you can still hear it. And I can't believe that they get away with making that much noise and disturbing the peace to that level on a regular basis. Um, it just seems like there's really no enforcement about speeding um, in general through this area. And I would also like to say that Riverside could use a couple more speed bumps too. When you go down the hill, down by Federal Street, right there at the American Legion, there needs to be one right there. So that's all I have to say. It really needs to happen. We need to have a way to keep people from accelerating only to hit their brakes at the bridge or to accelerate all the way up the street only to hit their brakes at the stop sign for Birch Pit Road. Um, it's just really out of control at times. It's very dangerous. We have to get in our car, my wife and I, and drive down the street and park in the neighborhood in Bay State Village to walk our dogs in a quieter park because we don't dare. We've tried here on Clement Street numerous times. It's like taking your life into your own hands to try to walk on this street. It's ridiculous. And there's no sidewalks. There's no anything here. And yet there's all these beautiful homes that are kept nice and spiffy and they're paying top dollar taxes to be in Northampton. I think the town should really do something to keep things a little nicer as far as the throughway um, and slow people down and, sh and have them show a little respect for the neighborhood. And that's what I have to say. Okay, thanks, Keith. Appreciate your comments. Anywhere on, anyone else here to speak on this? Katie, I see your actual hand up. So hold on a moment and we will um, unmute you. Katie Rosenblatt, Cindy. I'm clicking. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we also live on the corner of Burt's Pit and Clement Street. Um, I totally agree with Keith's comments about the speeding. And one thing that he said that actually wasn't true is that there is a no stop sign at the end of Clement Street towards the Burt's Pit end, which isn't helping with the speeding because people know that they can just sort of glide through it. And we're hearing all kinds of honking and aggressive just revving and yelling out of car windows because of it, because people are, they're almost crashing all the time. Um, so we would love to see a stop sign implemented. It would help both streets, I think, with some of the issues that are going on with the speeding and safety. So thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. And we are aware of the stop sign issue there where we're actually taking a look at that um, and making sure that warrants are met. Um, but but that, is, um, that is absolutely on our, on our list. Any other comments on Clement Street? Any comments from any members of the commission? I am hopeful that we will see some data back from the Federal Highway Administration on the implementation of advisory bike lanes and that they've been received favorably in uh, other communities. Um, because again, we feel that uh, Clement Street would would be an excellent uh, pilot project uh, for this. Um, I, I think many communities have seen very good results with them. 
Um, so we are hopeful that that our application, which is on hold, uh, will be moved forward by them. Um, in the meantime, we will certainly uh, we hear the comments uh, here, and as I noted, we are taking a hard look at a stop sign at, at that intersection, um, and we will be back in touch when we have um, further developments on this. Anyone else have any other comments for us? Okay, Beth, can you please have the record note that Adam Novit joined us uh, at about 4.15? Okay, Brad, I see your hand up. Uh, we'll unmute you. Hi, I was just curious where along the street was the speed data collected? Sometimes that can make a big difference on a shorter street. Thanks. Yeah, I'll let the chief speak to that. Go ahead, chief. Yep, I'm sorry. It's actually not indicated on here. Usually they aim for the middle of straightaways. I know it was obviously on the top portion, not down at the Ladd Avenue end, but I don't know where on the street it was. It does need to be mounted on a pole or an existing sign. So an officer would typically go out and look for the one that's in the middle of the street and place it there. But he didn't put the house number on here that I have. Okay, thanks, Chief. Okay, any other comments on Clement Street before we move on? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Next up is a discussion of a traffic calming request for Fruit Street. So this traffic calming request was submitted August 20th, 2021. Um, and this is, I, I guess, less of a traffic calming request and more of a commentary on parking. Um, so I think what's happening is that um, the road is quite narrow here. Uh, folks are parking on the side of the road close to driveways. Um, and what's happening is that, um, you know, there's, there's sort of an infringing on uh, traffic flow. Um, so just uh, a couple of things. We did not review collision data. We did not review speed data. Fruit Street provides one lane of travel in the northwest and southeast directions between Old South Street and Smith Street. It's approximately 1,040 feet long and 27 feet wide. There are asphalt sidewalks on the northeast side for the entire length. There are two marked crosswalks at the intersection with Old South Street and with Smith Street. Parking is prohibited on the southwesterly side from Old South Street to Smith Street and for short distances on the northeasterly side by the intersections of Smith Street and Old South Street. There is no existing speed regulation. Fruit Street is considered thickly settled and therefore the statutory speed limit is 30 miles an hour. Um, is there anyone here from the public who wishes to talk to us about this application? Okay, Taylor, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Ace Taylor. I'm the person who submitted this petition. Um, really, it is two concerns that I have, one regarding uh, the difficulties in parking and one regarding the difficulties in two-way traffic, particularly when there are things like PBTA buses or delivery trucks. Uh, I would request that the road be measured for width. I know that's something that can be done in order to determine if a road should in fact be one way or not. I do want to keep street parking as a matter of equity. The majority of the houses on this street are rentals, which means there's a higher degree of cars. The available parking lots in individual units can't necessarily handle the number of cars that exist. And I don't wanna lose parking on the road. That said, I would like there to be better regulations in place for the parking. Simply having tickets issued to people doesn't really work as a measure in my estimation as it provides punishment for guidelines that are unclear rather than the providing guidance for people to follow. Um, if parking spaces can't be made, at the very least having a marking of this is three feet away from uh, you know places that you can't park in front of driveways and the like would be very helpful. Uh, with regards to attempting to navigate the street, if a PVTA bus is coming down, uh, the path that it travels is from Smith Street to Old South Street, 
uh, and I'm driving in the opposite direction, I have to pull over to the side of the road in one of the zones where there's uh, no parking indicated in order to safely pass. This is a frequent occurrence that happens mm, about half of every time I commute to work, which is daily. Uh, so that's what these requests are about. Um, and I would love to know if there are further steps that I can take in order to make this uh, issue clearer and to have uh, possible follow-ups. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your comments. Um, is there anyone else here who wishes to talk to us about Fruit Street? Okay, I don't see anyone. So I I can um I I can respond to just a couple of your points. Um, so it you know this is a, a relatively narrow roadway um, as we would expect in a downtown district, the, the downtown business district, um, and it it is certainly a frequent occurrence. I mean, Market Street is another example of this, where um, you know narrow roadway parking, two way traffic. Um, and it, you know, it's, it, we refer to it often as, uh, the, the courtesy one-way traffic phenomenon, um, where you're actually forced to pull over, um, to let another car pass because it's simply not wide enough. Um, you know, are, you're correct. Our options are, you know, we eliminate parking, um, and allow the free flow of cars or, um, we turn it into a one-way. Um, you know, which is uh, uh, something that uh, actually affects the whole network of streets. It, it affects, you know, neighborhoods and then can, can sort of have a, um, an, an effect that, that moves beyond the neighborhood. Um, in this case, um, what we will do is we will, um, because I don't believe there are actually defined parking spaces in the area, we typically uh, try to define parking in downtown business districts for folks um, just to eliminate confusion um, and eliminate some of the scenario that you're talking about where people are, you know, parked too close to driveways or fire hydrants or um, in places that they shouldn't be because they don't know they're not supposed to park there. Um, so that that is certainly something that we can look at, but your comments are heard uh, about the, the roadway width. Um, is there uh, any other member of the commission that, that has any comments on Fruit Street for us or any observations about anything that might be helpful there? Parking um, within three feet of the driveway is an ongoing issue on that street. Um, I agree that it's uh, there are too many cars um, for the the area um, with the houses broken up into apartments. Um, there are a lot of cars for that area, and it is a constant struggle to try and keep them from parking too close to the driveways. Um, I think that it would benefit from actual marked spaces, or at the very least, like what we did up on I believe it was Middle Street where we originally put marks on the curb um, to try and show where that three foot um, area is. And I agree, it would be nice to be able to provide guidance um, as opposed to having to resort to just issuing the tickets. Um, although once you paint lines on the street, they have to be maintained and that on top of everything else, you know, is its own issue. So um, I'm more than happy to discuss this. And I agree that parking is definitely um, an ongoing struggle on that street. Thanks, Nancy. Any other comments on Fruit Street? Okay, Councilor Gore, go ahead. Um, I often take the PVTA bus that goes down that street and I agree that the, the bus has to stop or the person has to stop going the other way. So maybe it would benefit from being a one way. And since it, it runs parallel to um, a busier street, route, route five, I think that is, that maybe that wouldn't cause a big problem with other, with traffic patterns in general. Thank you, Councillor. Carolyn, go ahead. Um, I would be concerned to um, alter this to a one-way street. I think we might be then dealing with speeding um, concerns if um, 
it turns into a one way. I think they, and when we often talk about the fact that having the requirement that people need to stop and let others pass is traffic calming and makes and ensures that those trips are and the excuse me the traffic is slower. Um, I'm wondering. I'm looking at a street view of on on Fruit Street, and it looks like some curbs are painted for a segment, sort of curbs at driveways. And I don't know if that's something the city did or if the individual property owners did that. And, and it's not clear that it's three feet. But is that the kind of marking that you would be looking at doing to um, indicate the three foot separation? Would it be on the street or on the curb? And I wonder which one might be more visible and, you know, um, notable and last longer. It, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's very difficult. You know, we're we're always very selective about where we actually strike parking spaces because, as as Nancy said, it's it's certainly a, a maintenance item. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of linear feet of of you know double yellow center lines and parking spaces, and and there's a there's a cost associated with maintenance. You have to come through and hit those you know once a year to to keep them fresh. Um, in, in this particular case, I would tend to put the marking on the street um, because it is far more visible than on the curb. I can't speak to who might have painted the curb. You know, it's something that could, that could have happened years ago. That's not our typical practice. It's very, very rare that we would paint a curb. Um, we, we generally stripe the roadway. Um, so that would be what we look to do in this scenario is actually strike the roadway. And just a point of clarification about how we could um, contemplate turning a, a road into a one way, we would actually have to engage an engineering firm to do a network study. Um, this, this would not be a decision that's made within my department or, or with my engineers. Um, this is actually something that we would have to hire out um, to a consulting engineering firm that does this sort of work consistently for municipalities. Um, and when we talk about the network, we're talking about a, a fairly significant radius around these streets um, because you never want to have unintended consequences or undesirable consequences and push traffic somewhere you didn't think it was going to go. So turning a street one way is not um, something that that is just done. Um, it it always has impacts that have to be fully analyzed and understood before it, an ordinance like that could be brought forward. Does anyone else have any comments about Fruit Street for us? Okay, so we will. Um, we will have a conversation about what the uh, the best way to move forward is on that. We'll talk to uh, parking and um, and figure out what we can do to make things a little bit clearer here. Um, so appreciate you bringing this forward to us. Thank you. Okay, next up is a discussion of a traffic calming request for our Earl Street at Grove Street. So this came to us on September 20th, 2021. Um, resident concern is that um, this is kind of a, a wide intersection. The work used to describe it was uh, tricky because obviously we have a rail trail crossing. Um, so just a general safety concern for the intersection. Um, so in this case, um, we did take a look at the collision data. Chief, would you be able to speak to that? Yes, I can. So we did a five-year collision analysis that was conducted in September of 2021. There was one collision report and it was a single vehicle that struck a sign. Uh, a second vehicle was stopped for a person in the crosswalk and then the vehicle swerved to avoid rear-ending the stopped vehicle. So the accident was actually caused by what this person is uh, expressing concerns about, kind of the unexpected uh, crossing of pedestrians and cyclists through the intersection. And I did not collect speed data since that was not listed as a concern at this intersection. Okay, thanks, Chief. 
Um, so just a couple of engineering comments. The intersection of Rail Street with Grove and Texas Road is an all-way stop controlled intersection. There are existing crosswalks at all approaches. The Manhan Rail Trail enters this intersection from the northeast corner and from the southwest corner. Parking is allowed on all three of the streets I mentioned, and there are no existing speed regu regulations on any of these streets. Um, is there anyone here to speak to us about this intersection from the public? Brett, I see your actual hand up. Thanks. Um, I believe it was Councillor Foster who reached out to pedal people, and um, it is on behalf of several members of pedal people that I'm um, forwarding some comments. I will try to summarize them as we had a lot of discussion and feedback, uh, which I can provide in detail to the commission or to anybody interested um, upon request. Um, so it does seem like we have concerns for safety in that intersection. The it's 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 a tricky intersection. I, I I do you know we all agreed about that, you know we we dreamed big and we thought that a bridge for the rail trail, for the bike path, the multi-use path, whatever you want to call it, uh, would be wonderful uh, to emulate what the trains used to do, um, but that's an expensive thing, so that's probably too big a dream. Um, one small note about the pavement for the bike path um, when you're coming from downtown on the path and you're entering the intersection i guess there's a quite a uh jarring bump at where the asphalt joins the concrete we wanted to note that um, we would like to think about how to increase awareness for the for motor vehicles drivers that they might see these pedestrians or bicyclists, um, you know, whether that's a some kind of slowing them down or alerting them. Either, either way seems like a good idea. Um, um, da, 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 da. Uh, talking about signage and blinking lights as possibilities um, or a big old speed bump, but I don't think that's appropriate personally, um, right by the stop sign. Um, yeah, okay, I think that's most of the comments. And I would just say that um, the hill was also mentioned. So the, the topography matters in this case where three of the intersect, or at least two, two of the main intersect, uh, intersection uh, entry points are downhill to the stop signs. So people would like to continue through in a natural flow uh, rather than being naturally slowed by a hill going uphill. I think that's all I have to share at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Brett. Is there anyone else who has, um, or who's here from the public who wishes to speak about this intersection? Okay, any members of the commission who have any comments for us? Councillor Foster, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I was, I was glad to see this um, request in. Um, and I talked with some of the, the folks that live near the intersection and you know I go through this probably five or six times a day, either driving or walking or biking. And it, as Brett mentioned, there's there's the top topography that for many cyclists, because they're coming downhill, then they're crossing this wide intersection and going uphill again. Um, you know, for many cyclists, trying to maintain that momentum um, is important. Um, for drivers coming down the hill from Grove Street toward that intersection, um, heading east, they can't see the bike path to their right. Um, you know, sort of until they actually stop at that stop sign, you can't actually see that the bike path, um, you, you, there's there's brush and just the angle of it, you can't really see what's going on there. And then, you know, I think just a, a note on dri driver behavior, I guess it's also cyclist behavior, nobody stops at the stop signs. Like, um, I, I shouldn't say nobody, but the overwhelming majority of people roll through 
the stop signs, whether they're on bike or, or by car. Um, you know, and I think because it's such a big, wide intersection, except for that challenge coming down the hill from Grove where you can't see the bike path. Otherwise, you have really good visibility there. And I think it encourages, um, you know, it's not like you have to stop and really look to see what's going on in general as you're approaching the intersection. Um, for the most part, people tend to, to feel, to, to kind of have a sense of what's going on and, and just roll through. But it's, um, you know, my experience shows that many, many, many cars don't actually come to a complete stop there. Um, so it, there's, there is a lot going on and I think different, um, you know, user behavior between cars and bikes and pedestrians, um, you know, and, and I would take a guess for many drivers, a sense that they'd like to hurry up and get through the intersection before have, having to wait for a pedestrian or cyclist on those big wide crossing. So there's, I think there's a little bit of this, like, let me hurry up and get through it kind of behavior going on there. Thanks, Councillor. Anyone else have any comments on this intersection? I'm just looking at the, again, the street view and there is the bicycle signage coming on the, from the Earl Street approaches, but not the Grove. So um, particularly in that position that um, Councillor Foster mentioned coming down um, Grove Street to that intersection, there's no visual, um, you know, messaging about the bicycle crossing. Um, so that might be something to can, um, be considered. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, and that's what we'll take a look at. We'll take a look at, um, you know, signage in the area. I, I mean, now that we've heard these comments, I mean, obviously it's very wide, you know, so the, the more exposure a bicyclist or pedestrian has, obviously the less desirable that is, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the way the road is designed. Um, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at what we can do and, and that may include, um, you know, striping up that roadway a little bit better, um, or striping up those crosswalks. Um, so they pop a little bit more. Um, Brad, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, since it's such a wide intersection, is there a way to narrow it to, to, to bring the stop signs all closer together? In, in which case people would feel less like it's a wide open area that they can just go through and more like, oh, we're right up close and we can look at other people and humans and see them and care for them and <laughs> be careful of them. Is there a way to, 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 to bring those intersections closer? I know it's probably tough, but is there, you know, if, even if one of those is moved, it could make a difference for the others. Thanks. Yeah, and, you know, typically we do something like that with curb, in, curb extensions. That's sort of the most common um, traffic calming mechanism that, that we would employ when you do something like that. Um, what happens is that that has utility impacts. Often the utilities are running very close to the curb line, um, you know, so that they can be accessed, um, you know, in the roadway. Um, so what happens is anytime you, you sort of shrink the roadway, you're now shrinking the roadway on top of the utilities, which can often um, create a scenario where you've got a, a pretty expensive and or extensive utility relocation. And, and often um, that, that actually involves drainage, you know, so typically you have catch basins, you know, that need to be relocated or, um, you know, some sort of underground utilities, as I mentioned. So um, it's certainly something that we can look at, um, but generally that can be the biggest impediment to doing what may seem like a pretty easy fix is, is what's what's buried in the ground. Anyone else have any comments on this intersection before we move on? Okay, seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to a discussion of traffic calming requests for Chestnut Street. So this came to us uh, in November of 2021 as three different requests. Um, the resident concern was um, uh, speeding as, as a cut through. A um, lot of uh, folks in the area with uh, children. 
Um, so from an engineering perspective, uh, Chestnut Street is approximately 3,720 feet long and it runs between Bridge Road and Pine Street. It ranges from 24 to 28 feet wide. There are sidewalks on the west side from Pine Street to Main Street and on both sides of the street from Main Street to number 40. The sidewalk on the east side continues from House 140 to Bridge Road. There are several parking restrictions along the street. There is an existing speed regulation for Chestnut Street. Um, this is actually implemented in 1986. The speed limit starting at Pine Street and headed northerly for 0.7 miles towards Bridge Road is 30 miles an hour. The pavement condition does rain. Some sections are in good condition and others are in poor condition. Uh, Chief, would you like to speak to speed and collision data? Yes, uh, I did the five-year collision analysis in November of 2021. So five years back from there, there was a total of 16 collisions on this stretch of Chestnut Street. Um, it was notable that of those 16, eight of them involved vehicles striking parked cars, and four of those involved vehicles that were backing out of driveways striking parked cars. Usually when I'm looking at this data, I'm looking for trends. So it was notable that 50% of the collisions involved uh, parked cars. Five of the collisions occurred at the intersection with High Street. This is the intersection that has stop signs uh, on High Street and four of those collisions were caused by vehicles failing to actually stop at those stop signs. Then there were two collisions occurred where the bike path crosses over Chestnut Street. One of these involved a dog uh, that was struck. And then there were two collisions that involved a vehicle and a bicyclist and both resulted in minor injuries. Uh, in both instances, uh, the cyclists uh, had, they were at fault. Uh, they entered the roadway without stopping and collided with the side of a vehicle. One was at the bike path crossing, the other was not. So a lot of different variety in the types of collisions occurring on the stretch of Chestnut Street. As for speed data, speed data was collected in November of 2021. We put the collection device in front of 174 Chestnut Street. During that time, we measured the speeds of about 10,400 vehicles. The average speed was 27. The 85th percentile speed was 32.8. This is a 30 mile per hour zone. So it's an average of 2.8 over the posted speed limit. So we did not identify speed as a significant issue. That's an overview of all the data I have for this section of street. Okay, thanks chief. Um, are there any members of the public here who wish to speak to us about their experience? on Chestnut Street, please raise your hand. Rob, I see your actual hand up, so we will unmute you. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I live on Chestnut Street. I live at 100 Chestnut Street. Um, I've lived there for about seven or eight years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I should also thank my counselor, Alex, for uh, noting uh, that this meeting was coming up. It's one of the reasons I'm here. Um, I just wanted to say that um, my lived experience maybe tells a little bit more than the data does. I have an 11 year old daughter who just started JFK on her bike and uh, you know, she commutes to JFK from, her, from, uh, from our house on her bike. And it's a little bit scary to see her get onto the road. Um, I don't know if I would be comforted by the fact that 85% of the time, you know, drivers are adhering to the speed limit when I know that there's about 15% of the time that they're not adhering to the speed limit. Um, I should also note that one of the reasons there's so many parked cars on Chestnut Street is many of us have taken to kind of guerrilla calming mechanisms where we park cars strategically to slow people down. So that space of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of the roadway between my house and Bridge Road is really, I think, where all the speeding happens, where they, you know, they come up from um, Main Street, past the bike path, rise to a hill at, at uh, High Street. They kind of slow down there, but then right past High Street, when they go past my house, they really start to pick up and really, you know, speed quite a bit all the way to Bridge Road. Um, and as you know, in order to get from Bridge Road to Main Street in Florence, you'd either take North Maple or, or my street. Um, so 
those are just my lived experiences. Um, I, I certainly think speeding's an issue. I just um, and I would love to see some type of calming measure uh, measures enacted. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Appreciate it. Anyone else have any comments for us about this road? Okay, Jacob, I see your actual hand up. Hi, thanks. Uh, I also live on Chestnut uh, 246 Chestnut. Uh, we've lived here. Hi, neighbors. Um, I like the gorilla tactic, by the way. I might start parking my van out there. Um, I, I uh, also, in my lived experience, have seen, I feel like I see a lot of um, speeding cars. I, I don't know what kind of variance you have in that data. Uh, you know, there's a lot of us drive slowly that are residents on the street. And we may be bringing down that average where there might be, you know, on the far side of that collection of data, some uh, people that don't live on the street that are just cutting through and trying to get to the other side as quickly as possible. I've, I've also seen a lot of people, um, you know, going from Maine to Bridge uh, as a cut through and they're not residents. So uh, I'm assuming. Um, so, um, you know, they're, they're not particularly concerned uh, about going slowly. Uh, a lot of kids in the neighborhood. Uh, I have a, a, a kid at JFK also. Uh, he happens to use a wheelchair. I don't know if that is any kind of leverage uh, that could be used in, in terms of providing uh, a crosswalk or arguing uh, for, um, you know, something that allows for him to cross the street as we only have a sidewalk on the other side of the street. Um, so he is basically, um, you know, contained over on in our driveway and won't be able to independently cross the street because we're pretty close to this to bridge. So, and people turn on that on Chestnut, really high rate of speed. Um, so, you know, that's another consideration. Um, I don't want to, you know, use my son's disability. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, if if my son's disability is something that will help slow people down, it will help him. Um, I'm perfectly willing, and he'd be perfectly willing, probably, to come speak at at a at a group for a group like this, also, um, and would argue, you know, that if adaptive uh, steps can be taken that happen to coincide with the the slowing and street calming um, steps, then, um, you know, that I just want to put that on the table. Um, but yeah, I don't know that I have anything else to add. So it's just a general concern. Uh, and I'm not sure what steps can be taken, but it would be great to see something taken. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your comments. I appreciate it. Um, the the um, person under the handle, Craig Della Pena, I see your hand has been up in sort of various iterations. Go ahead. Thank you for uh, having this meeting here today. I'm looking forward to it. I don't think this is the first time we've had a traffic calming debate on, on Chestnut Street from several years ago, which was a similar sort of uh, effort, but this is much more high tech, of course. And um, I want to offer up a funny story to start here. Uh, a former DPW director in Northampton, I won't mention the name, but when I talked about this, putting a speed table on the Great, the grade crossing for the dead trail, dead railroad, now a trail. He said, oh, we can't do that. There's not four storm sewer quadrants there. Well, of course there is. Excuse me. Of course there is. But I didn't uh, make anything of it. But I will let you know that, that we live eight feet from the trail. We live at number 62 Chestnut Street. As many of you know, I'm not there by accident. And we've lived there now about 20 years. And we've seen it all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And some of the bad is a couple of car collisions with bicyclists. And so we're on the cusp now of installing a webcam on the front of our house. So we will document the speeding. We will document the crashes that are about to happen. And so we will be back. If Kathy wants to say something about our guests. We operate a bed and breakfast there. And yes, the hi. Extra. I want to thank all my neighbors and thank Alex um, for making this happen. But I live in fear every single time I sit out on my porch that somebody is going to get hit on that trail. 
the cars begin at Cooper's and they speed down Chestnut Street and it's becoming more and more. And that's me as a person living on Chestnut Street. Now we have guests and we have two Adirondack chairs placed out in front uh, where people can look out onto the street and a common comment from people that are not in this area is, boy, people go really fast on the street. Aren't you concerned? We're very much concerned. And I just, again, you know, I, I reiterate everything everybody else has said. Um, I don't know what that speed table, I think people realize that there's a speed table or, or something set up to check their mile or their speed. So they naturally slow down. But living there for 20 years, it's nothing, it's gotten worse every year. And I just, I pray something terrible doesn't happen. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your comments. We appreciate it. Um, Tara, I see your hand up next, so we will unmute you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, great. Um, I'm Tara Brewster, and I live at 67 Chestnut Street. I've lived there for about uh, almost seven years, and I'm right on the bike path. I'm actually diagonally across from Craig and Kathy, um, so very close to the Pie Bar and Coopers, um, and I have two young kids. Uh, Charlie is six and Madeline is nine. Um, we do a lot of things on the bike path. We're on and off the bike path walking around town, and um, We've noticed a lot of near misses, um, a lot of screeching halts, um, a lot of angry pedestrians on the bike path, a lot of angry drivers, and it's kind of increased over the years since we've been there. Um, so I think that we have uh, a different problem of, of cars <laughs> um, kind of coming from Bridge Street. We see that um, they really start to pick up speed coming off of bridge um, and coming down towards the center of town because they don't really start to stop um, until they see the, the traffic light ahead. They don't really stop until after they go through the crosswalk. So a lot of people don't see the crosswalk to the bike path um, until it's too late, until someone's trying to cross the road. Um, so, you know, I think that people coming from Chestnut Street aren't really going um, super fast, but people coming from bridge are, are really um, going at high rates of speed. So um, I'm in favor of this. And again, I'd like to thank our city councilor, Alex Jarrett for letting us all know that this was happening today. Okay, thanks very much. Any other comments from anyone on Chestnut? Okay, any comments from any members of the commission? Okay, um, we appreciate everyone coming out today. I mean, part of, again, as I've said, our process on these streets is, is you know, we do sort of a hard data review, um, but then we actually want to hear what you have to say, what your actual lived experience is, um, you know, sometimes uh, tells a little bit of a different story. So we will, um, we will uh, take all these comments under advisement. I also like to mention um, that we did receive quite a few emails from folks um, which I will have appended to the minutes of this meeting. So various uh, residents of Chestnut Street also wrote in their comments to us. So I just want to make sure that that's part of the record of the meeting. Um, so anyway, we will take a look at all of this and um, see what we can come up with. Um, and we will communicate out um, with you folks when we make some decisions. So um, thanks to, to all of you who, who were here today. Appreciate it. Okay, next up is a discussion of the downtown parking fee structure. Um, so we have a proposed ordinance that uh, Carolyn is going to speak to. Carolyn, go ahead. Um, so you saw this briefly um, towards the end of the summer, I think. Um, as an ordinance and that we had just finished it. So there wasn't a lot of time to discuss, but we um, put it um, in the council packet and council referred this ordinance back out to transportation and parking. So they're looking for a recommendation 
about this ordinance. And just to recap, and for those who weren't part of that conversation, <laughs> um, the city undertook a study um, or, or hired Fantech, I should say, to reevaluate the parking fee structure in downtown based on comments uh, from businesses and from users in downtown about trying to figure out ways that we could address um, parking turnover, particularly on the, um, the segment of Main Street between um, West Street and um, the uh, railroad bridge or, or Holly and Market Street, I should say. Um, so Stantec picked up, um, uh, sort of reevaluated a parking study that was done um, by the, um, by a firm that looked at this about seven years ago and then other work that Santec had done for the city and came up with some recommendations. And we'd done some public outreach um, with the downtown businesses. And so in front of you is the draft that represents the conversations that we've had over the last several months about parking modifications. The ordinance does a few things um, sort of all at once. It takes different sections of parking um, and addresses um, um, just updating the language to a comment to uh, address the fact that we have different parking collection systems and that's not just the meters. It restructures the fees so that they're incrementally um, increased along the Main Street spine. And I, I can show you the map um, where that is. Um, and then it reduces those fees on the side streets. Um, it also, this ordinance would authorize the mayor to set time and fee limits based on occupancy. So it's more of a, a performance kind of ordinance than just strictly um, set in stone um, for, that would then require city council to vote to change it back. Um, it gives it more uh, flexibility in that regard to sort of evaluate um, what's happening with parking and with um, um, the businesses along Main Street. So that's a new section. And then um, there were a couple of areas that weren't quite regulated or that had probably changed over time and it wasn't matching up with the um, table. So in particular, the roundhouse parking lot has had a lot of modifications over the last couple of years and that wasn't reflected in the ordinance. So there's um, a question actually in the ordinance about that, about sort of what parking um, classification the roundhouse lot should be or principally the back portion of the roundhouse lot should be. So I think that's um, an item that commission should discuss. But in terms of detail, going through the text, um, starting out at the beginning is really about um, um clarifying that um where there is not uh, sort of changing the table um indicating that the hours of operation for parking um, particularly on main street is going to be regulated from 8 a.m to i'm sorry from 10 a.m to 8 p.m instead of 8 a.m to 6 p.m so there's a shift a two-hour shift um for when parking enforcement would take place um and then also a clarification about um, where there's not a time limit. There's, so there are many spaces that are time limited. And even if you pay the meter, you still are not allowed to pay beyond two hours or one hour, whatever is regulated in the code. This would shift that for some locations and but clarify that even the, you still need to pay for the time that you're spending in those slots, you're just not restricted to a two hour time limit or a one hour time limit. And in no case can you just park your car for more than 72 hours. So it's not a, you know, a long term um, overnight parking stall for you, um, whether or not, um, regardless of whether you're paying. Um, so that's the first section of the code there with that text changes in, in 312.36 uh, relative to parking meter locations and regulations. Um, um, moving down to the table, um, this is the sort of the meat of the ordinance as it relates to shifting that timeline from a 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. instead of a um, 8 to 6. 
And there is a, there was a typo the way, or there was a, um, we didn't catch this change when it went to council. So the other action item for tonight would be to recommend um, an edit to this piece. There's three, there are four highlighted um, times on this page. They should really read 8 p.m. instead of 9 p.m. And it's really just sort of a leftover um, time slot in there that um, when there was debate sort of back and forth about what how that shift should be made. So there's an edit there that would be good to get um, comments on from the um, commission. And um, as you can see in this table, the nine to five, I mean, sorry, <laughs> the um, along Main Street, which is class 1A. And so if you were to refer back to the map, 1A is right on Main Street, those spots would be $1.50 per hour paid in 25 cent increments um, and uh, from 10 to five and then from five to 8 p.m. It should read, it would go up to $2 per hour. Um, and then in the, at the same time, those um, rates would drop from 75 per um, cents per hour to 50 cents per hour on the side streets, which are which is what the 1B classification is. Um, and those are, that's the sort of the bulk of that shift in the timing and the, and the rates per hour. And then the rest of the text or the table really is, uh, are tweaking the, um, regulations to eliminate the time limits in some of these um, areas so that they're either they go from an hour restriction to an NA but with the caveat that you still need to pay and um, you can't stay there unless it's the parking garage you can't stay there uh, for more than 72 hours. Um, so then going down to section five is the paragraph about um, uh, the mayor being authorized to develop regulations which set time limits and fees for the schedule, and these should, and then uh, they should be filed with the city clerk. And the alteration of the fee and the schedule would be based on meeting a target goal of 85% occupancy um, over a one-week period. And so the idea is this ordinance would also sort of institute a, a check so that there are two times a year, sort of summer and winter, in which we look at what that occupancy is on Main Street and adjust it so that we can optimally maintain that um, occupancy rate. Um, and then the remainder of the ordinance is really just cleaning up to show that we've merged classes and the hours of, um, of allowance for the parking. And then finally, the last section is about the roundhouse going all the way sort of to the bottom um, is um, adding the roundhouse lot uh, that wasn't previously defined in the ordinance. And there's a question mark here because I, I, you know, I, in the planning office, we're not equipped. To, we don't usually um, deal with the parking regulations. And I don't think this was ever discussed um, about what the, how the roundhouse parking lot should be classified. So that's just sort of our best guess, um, but want to open that up to the folks who actually understand this stuff better than we do. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that summary, Carolyn. I appreciate it. Um, can you uh, um, clarify, I have this on the agenda as a discussion of this fee structure. Are you looking for a recommendation from this commission or are we looking to sort of clean up the question marks and maybe make a revision to the 8 p.m., 9 p.m. issue that you mentioned? What What is council looking for from us exactly? Well, I, I think they're looking for a recommendation and making sure that there's nothing in conflict with, um, you know, anything that they might have missed. But as part of that recommendation, recommending, you know, as um, edited um, with any modifications. Okay. Um, it, I, yeah, I guess I, I just uh, procedurally, and I would defer to the counselors on this commission, I have this written as a discussion of the downtown parking fee structure. So I just want to make sure that procedurally it's appropriate 
that we could put forward a motion, um, you know, to amend this or to make a positive recommendation. Is that a problem? Though it's not listed like that on here. I I, I just want to make sure we're not in violation of any rules. Not to put the counselors on the spot, but I'm putting the counselors on the spot. Counselor Foster, go ahead. Oh, Counselor Gore, did you want to jump in? I saw you no, unmuted at the I, same I'm time. Not, I'm not sure about it. Okay. My sense is that I'm not sure if we can, although I was going to say, I'm not sure if we can vote, but that would be a binding vote. A recommendation is a, is a little bit different. It's kind of a, a softer, um, so now I'm, I'm thinking out loud and twisting myself in knots, but I actually think that my understanding is we may be okay with a recommendation because we're not, it's not like we're voting on a policy, we're voting on a recommendation. So those, that's a very different thing. It, yeah, I mean, generally the flow is that this commission makes a, a recommendation, typically a positive one, and then that flows to the clerk of the council who puts it on a city council agenda with a note that this council has made a positive recommendation. Um, and then from there, it gets referred to like legislative matters or, or wherever it goes. So I just want to make sure that procedurally, the way I have this listed on the agenda is not a problem before we, um, before we continue the conversation here. But it sounds like maybe it's not. I, I think we're okay procedurally is, is my read on that. Caroline, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I would say that as well. On uh, um, it is posted on the agenda. You, it was also officially referred by council. Um, so I, I think, and that it's a recommendation. So you're not making, you know, a final decision as a body, but you're just, you know, pushing that on. Okay. All right. I appreciate the clarification. I just always like to check and make sure we're we're not we're operating within the bounds of propriety. Um, I, I guess my first comment would be um, we should probably have discussion on the roundhouse lot and how that should be um, codified within the proposed ordinance. Um, so I, I would certainly defer that. I mean, DPW looks at, you know, is there enough space to park here? But um, we don't typically um, get involved in regulation at that level. Um, so I. I would have to um, defer on that. I, I don't know the answer to that. So I don't know if um, Nancy wants to jump in or anyone else wants to jump in on that. There are a couple of things with the um, changes to the roundhouse parking lot that really should be addressed. Um, the addition of um, the compact car parking spaces those need to be codified. We don't currently have an ordinance covering the compact car parking. And on the map, are those noted with those? Is that what the, um, that's not EV, that's compact, you said, right? Right, right, yeah. that, that's brand new. Those, those were just added. Um, and they were just added. Well, when when via code or they were, they were just, just added. They just were added when the okay. um, when the construction happened there. Uh huh. They appeared. Um. How do you regulate that? I mean, like on the, how do you enforce that? I should say. We can't, we don't have an ordinance to enforce it. And for, and is the, are these the first compact car bases in the city system? No, there are, there's one on main street that's not enforceable. Um, there's a couple in the parking garage. Um, and these out here in the roundhouse parking lot. So it might make sense um, to put all of those together in one separate ordinance and, and um, move that forward. Um, and um, then that could 
this could still move o move forward on its own, but have make sure that we're grabbing all those compact spaces in at once with a definition and um, mm -hmm. whatever the um, enforcement mechanism is going to be for those. Um, they would still have the same. They would still be within the same fee structure, correct? Is that right? right? Yeah. Um, so the lots across the street are three C and are a combination of three C and four C classes. So um, I don't know if it makes sense to carry those over, Nancy, to the roundhouse um, parcel or roundhouse lot, I should say. I think that would be appropriate because there is one section in Old South lot that has the two the um, limited parking for two hours, whereas the rest is uh, long-term parking and the same thing um, is happening in the roundhouse lot where there's one section that's the short-term where the rest of it is long-term. So that would be, that would be correct. So it actually, so 3C looks like it's the hourly parking and 4C is the uh, monthly pass. So um, the um, can you buy a monthly pass yep. in that roundhouse parking lot? Yeah, okay. all three of those lots would act the same way. Okay, so it sounds like maybe then it should be three C and four C um, in that slot. Carolyn, let me ask this. Are there enough modifications that need to be made to this that um, it would be best to have the commission make a neutral recommendation? Um, or I just want to procedurally make sure we're sort of giving this what it needs. Um, if we need to pull out the compact car and sort of combine that you know, with other locations, I, I'm just trying to think of the, the easiest way to execute this. Yeah, I mean, I think I see it, the compact car thing is a separate um, regulation that needs to be uh, adopted. It sounds like there's not one in the, on the books for any of them. So um, that doesn't, that there's nothing to pull from this ordinance that's re re relative to that. Many times ordinances go through and there are modifications that have to be made and, and they're made at various stages in the, in the process. And then that body recommends to city council to adopt the ordinance with um, modifications um, to, in this instance, to the roundhouse lot, um, clarifying that that's gonna be class C, 3C and 4C, and with um, the modification to the time limit for enforcement on um, the class 1A and 1B to, um, 8 p.m. instead of 9 p.m. And that um, procedurally is appropriate and can go forward to council with those um, uh, modifications. So those are the two modifications you're looking for for this ordinance and uh -huh. um, and the compact car is a it's a separate topic that, that we would take up um, likely at this commission at a, at a future meeting. Right. Okay. Okay, um, in that case, um, what I would propose is we put a motion on the floor for a positive recommendation for for this ordinance with the following two modifications. And please correct me if I get this wrong. The roundhouse is 3C and 4C, and the enforcement times for 1A and 1B are 8 p.m. instead of 9 p.m. So we'd be looking for a motion for a positive recommendation to move this forward with those two changes. Is that accurate? Okay, so I'll put the, I'll ask if anyone would like to make a mo would like to make a, a I'll make that motion of that. Thank you, Councillor. Is there a second? I'll second if I can do that. Thanks, Chief. All right, do we need to um, discuss further or clarify further? Councillor, go ahead. Um, just a, actually more of a question for Nancy. 
Um, the, the different, I'm just more curious, the change in hours for your operations. I'm, I'm assuming that's all work. I, I just was curious how that, how that worked on your end. For the staff? Well, um, we would have to address the staffing issues. Um, these, we have full-time and part-time uh, officers. This would probably require um, an addition of officers um, to provide enough coverage. Currently, the officers work until 6 p.m. So we would need to um, make some schedule changes. And um, I, I believe that it would probably require more officers. Okay, thanks. Adam, I see your hand up. Do you have a question? Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I was on the parking subcommittee uh, of the parking commission many years ago, um, and I sort of wrote a short white paper about this, and I'm glad to see that a lot of the recommendations that I made uh, on that committee with, um, I think Wayne, Wayne was on the committee at the time. Um, one of the observations that I made, I used uh, time-lapse cameras downtown. And I noted that there was very little competition for parking spaces before 10 o'clock, um, but a good deal after uh, parking um, was free. And if you're using parking as a way to ration, if you're using pricing and um, other tools to, as a way to ration uh, parking for that, um, so that there can be vacant parking spaces, then I think that this, uh, actually makes a lot of the recommendations um, that were pretty apparent uh, all those years ago, maybe seven or 10 years ago. So I just want to say I'm very glad to see this finally coming into fruition. And um, and I just want to lend my support as somebody that's thought a lot of these things for a long time. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate those comments. Nancy, go ahead. I did also want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. Um, Metered parking is not the only type of parking controls that need to be monitored and enforced. Um, there are a lot of other parking regulations and ordinances that the parking enforcement officers have. To. Um, so, and, and if you start parking meters at 10 a.m., that doesn't mean that the officers would run from 10 to 8. You still need to have them there in the morning um, to cover other types of ordinance violations. So we need to think beyond just the metered parking. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Can I ask a question, a follow-up question on that, Nancy? So if we make a positive recommendation here, I mean, there's still issues with staffing on your side that need to be addressed and correct that not be considered at the same time just putting it out there that with the extension of hours for um, monitoring and enforcement you need to have enough people to cover that yeah and i assume that your folks are not or you don't have significant staff running after five o'clock to cover this enough at least we would have no staff after 6 p.m currently okay gotcha That's a good point, Jamie. I think that um, you know, if if we were to move this with a positive recommendation, we could certainly um, submit our comments, you know, to the clerk of the council that um, that staffing in the the parking department would would need to be um, you know reviewed and and potentially funded. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. That's exactly what I would do. I think that we would also have to. Um, 
take into account the logistics of being able to change hours. Um, if you're going to change the uh, fee structure, depending upon what hour of the day, uh, logistically on the side streets, you have standalone meters that don't change with the hours. Um, so we would have to look at logistically what, what can our equipment do? The pay stations are different. Um, I would be concerned about what we could and could not um, provide as far as the standalone meters. So it's those static old technology meters. And, and I'm, I'm not the meter maintenance person. That would have to be a Brian question um, as to what they can and can't do. So I would have to defer to that. Councillor Foster? Is it primarily the red capped meters or is it like the, the ones that are currently long-term or are the meters all different? I, I, I don't use them enough. Well, on the side streets, you have the regular two hour meters, um, but also on some of the side streets and, and some of the main streets like South Street and um, Bridge Street, you do have areas that have a combination of both. Um, so I just, like I said, I, I don't know um, what we can mechanically do with those. So then if I could follow up, maybe this is more of a bigger picture when it comes back to council, like legislative matters um, committee conversation, but it sounds like this, it makes a lot of sense to me from a parking management perspective, uh, you know, so for, for what this commission is looking at, but then I'm, I'm considering that the parking department would need a budget review as far as staffing hours and technology in order to implement this. So that's something that as a council, we could anticipate seeing, um, but would know that would that would need to come along with any changes like are like what are proposed. Yes, I, I would hope, I would expect that we would have um, meter maintenance come in uh, and talk about that and what we can and can't do with our equipment. Um, also, the cost of making the changes um, to the uh, the kiosks, you know, with the with the programming changes. Um, so there are a lot of different areas that we would want to sit down and discuss. And then Nancy, do you have any concern about um, revenue from the meters with a change like this? Like, would that impact the department budget or anything like that? Well, any changes have the potential for impacting, uh, you know, revenue stream and and budgets. Um, you know, if you're you're going to extend the hours um, where you're going to require people to pay to park, um, and then some some rates are going to go up and down. It, yeah. So where does that balance? Yeah, I mean, they seem like smart changes, but you know, we ought to understand that if it could have a material impact to, to your department or, or anywhere else. Sure. I think part of the equation too, right, Nancy, would be to sort of evaluate how many people and is there an increase in the use of the app um, versus putting actual money into the meter? And um, is that, that goes into the calculation of how much, um, you know, mechanical equipment has to be modified because the app can probably be adjusted. Right, uh, oh, absolutely. The, the app, which has become very popular, um, can be adjusted. The, the kiosks can be adjusted. My concern would be the side streets because um, logistically we did look at um, the, some of the side streets and we found that the sidewalks aren't wide enough to accommodate a pay kiosk. So that's why the standalone meters remain in those areas. So, so there are some other areas that should be discussed. So 
just to kind of round out the conversation here, what I what I'm hearing is that there are staffing impacts, there are potential revenue impacts, there are equipment capability um, reviews that that would need to happen. The the question for this commission, um, in in the interest of keeping this moving and having those conversations um, or having those continuing conversations. Um, we have a motion on the floor for a positive recommendation um, with the changes, the 3C and 4C, the 1A and 1B at 8 p.m. instead of 9 p.m. Do we want to push this with a positive recommendation and notes from this commission noting um, what we just talked about, staffing revenue and equipment capabilities, or do we want to alter this to a neutral recommendation um, so that those items are reviewed? Councillor Foster? It's actually my motion on the floor. So thank you for, for bringing that up. And um, I would like to change it to a neutral recommendation. So that to, to give, yeah, it would be hard to make a positive recommendation until we have those answers. I agree. Um, procedurally, does the um, positive recommendation need to be rescinded or can it be altered by the person who made the motion? Procedurally, I'm not 100% sure. So how about I withdraw my motion and then may I make a new motion for a neutral recommendation with those changes as you outlined for us before. Good, may I have a second? Second. Okay, so Beth, we have a, a motion on the floor for a neutral recommendation um, to move this ordinance forward with uh, the changes of uh, 3C and 4C in the roundhouse lot and the enforcement time of 1A and 1B at 8 p.m. instead of 9 p.m. So we have a neutral recommendation on the floor. Believe that that's accurate, please. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. And what I would do is um, ask that we vote on this and um, we will actually submit comments to the clerk of the council um, for all the things that we've talked about here, which is uh, uh, staffing in the parking office, uh, rev potential revenue impacts and, and the review of equipment capabilities. Um, so, so that'll be a note that I send to the clerk of the council um, once this moves. Does anyone else have any comments on this? Um, and hopefully that's all, everything I've said is accurate. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Camilla? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diana? Yes. The unanimous. Beth? Next up are updates on previously submitted traffic calming applications. Um, so first I have Olive Street. This was submitted to us on February 24th, 2021. We discussed it here at TPC July 20th, 2021. And again in September of 2021, um, based on the comments that we received, the resident input, our um, uh, speed and collision data, um, an engineering review. Our recommended action is that at the intersection with South Street, beige painted curb extensions are proposed, gonna visually narrow the entrance of Olive Street and may reduce the speed at which vehicles turn onto the street. Existing crosswalk will be removed, a new crosswalk will be painted. Um, additionally, on the hill uh, coming up out of the meadows, um, we are going to put some signage up and, and I won't read all of this, it's on the screen in front of you. Um, but we are also going to be installing some roadside delineators. So they're, they're typically like yellow delineators that you see like on the side of um, curves um, or like the highway or sort of in rural areas. And, and that can also act as a, a visual aid to slow traffic down. 
Um, I, you know, I, I, just a note about this, you know, a lot of times these are fairly long in development. Um, obviously, you know, we're talking about something that we discussed a year ago, um, but this is contractor work and we can't just mobilize a contractor to do like a piecemeal um, part of a project. So we have to wait until we have a, a larger project. We have the contractor mobilized within the city limits. Um, and, and then what we do is we're able to implement some of these changes. So um, as I mentioned, we have our line striping contractor mobilized now, and that's why we're able to, um, to implement uh, these changes on Olive Street. So that's Olive Street, and next is North Maple Street. So this was submitted to us June 10th, 2021. It was discussed at TPC February 15th, 2022. And our recommended action is that we've engaged an engineering consultant to determine if a stop control on High Street at the intersection with North Maple is warranted. And we additionally um, are gonna be restriping the crossings actually in that entire corridor um, for the rail trail. So um, we have you know, quite a few um, rail trail crossings in, in that entire Florence corridor. Um, and, and we're gonna be trying to make those pop a little bit uh, more with um, with some uh, different color paint um, and some enhanced signage. So again, part of our roadway striping contract um, that we're able to make these changes. So uh, next up, does anyone have any new business? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn? So move move. To adjourn. Second. Who was the first? Nancy was. Nancy, thank you. Okay, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Carolyn? Yeah. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diana. Yes. Unanimous at nine. Okay. Thanks everyone for a good meeting. We'll see you next month. Bye. Okay. Take care.